Today we're going to take a first look at the CP68 operating system, which was written for the Motorola 6800 processor. We'll also show how we got this operating system running on this Southwest Technical 6800 computer, along with the MF68 disk subsystem. That's the five and a quarter inch drive cabinet and the DC1 disk controller that Southwest offered for their 6800 computer. Now this is the same system that we have run the Flex operating system on in several other videos. So as part of this two-part series, we'll be able to compare and contrast Flex and CP68 and see how they compare to each other. One thing that's interesting about CP68 is that it was not distributed on floppy disk. Instead, it was distributed as a book, published and written primarily by Jack Hemingway. First part of the book was basically just a user's manual and an advanced programmer's manual. Same things you would expect to find in a the manuals that came with any operating system. And then the remainder of the book was basically source listings of all the files that made up CP68 and the, the main utilities it came with. Following the source files were dumps of the S record versions of all of these, which is essentially the binary output of the assembler, the executable version of all the files. Um, and you may wonder, how does one go from a book to a bootable disk? And interestingly, that's not addressed in the book anywhere. It's not even mentioned. Uh, conceivably, you could type in all the source code that's all there. Um, unfortunately, though, it's about 200 pages worth of typing, and that would take a fairly capable computer to be able to handle that large of a software development. The other option, you could type in all the S record files. That's less typing, but even that's still about 30,000 characters of typing. And as you could see, typing in all these long sequences of numbers would be extremely error prone, so that's really not a a feasible solution either. Now in trade publications the author did have product announcements and um, ads that mentioned that OEM inquiries were available so obviously for a fee you could even get it fully customized for your machine and ready to boot and I imagine you could also pay a small fee and actually get maybe the S record files on cassette or paper tape. Now he went on to write several other books that augmented CP68. For example, he wrote a fairly nice macro assembler, the relocatable assembler you see here. It was published by Byte Magazine, and it included barcodes in it. They called it Paperbyte. Byte developed this format for their own publication where they could include source code in their um, magazine articles. And then they also published a book about the format of that, and that's what you see here. This is, uh, it's called Paperbyte, and here's a book that describes the details of that barcode, barcode format. I've put a link to that information in the uh, information under the video if you want to read more about that. Since we're going to be demonstrating the CP68 operating system today, you may wonder, how did I go from the book to an executable disk? And the answer is most of that work was done by another hobbyist named Roberto. He has spent the last year resurrecting several vintage 6800 operating systems and getting them to run on his fork of the SimH emulator. Here we're taking a look at the 6800 portion of his GitHub repository. And it's really worth looking at the, look, uh, at the work he's done, so I've put a link to this repository in the information below the video. Now what he did was take the S record pages out of the manual and use OCR on them to generate actual ASCII files of the S records. And as you can imagine, since the original scans weren't great and this was printed on a dot matrix printer, um, there was a plenty of errors that had to be found and fixed. It was still a pretty intensive manual effort to get that all together. But once he did, we have a collection of S record files that represent the executable binaries of all of CP68 and its utilities. And using the load command in the monitor in SWATBUG, we can load the portions we need in order to get CP68 running just enough to initialize a disk and start putting the files on it we need to then make a bootable disk. Mm -hmm. However, these S record files still aren't quite ready to run on the Southwest technical machine because they were specifically designed to run on the author's own machine. It had eight inch drives instead of five and a quarter and a completely different disk controller than we have in the Southwest technical. And so we're going to have to do some patching to account for the differences between the two machines. However, the work we have to do for the disk controller is going to be fairly significant. But fortunately, the author grouped all disk I.O. into three files that are part of uh, CP68. So we can just update those three files and account for the differences between the machines as far as the disk goes. 
One of those files is the actual disk controller code itself. Uh, it does sector read and write for the operating system. Another one is the cold boot routine. It gets loaded off of track zero into memory by the boot prom. And then it goes into the file system and loads the system file that is CP68 into memory and jumps to it. Um, it is specific to the disk because it is running before there's any disk drivers in there, so it has to directly access the controller. And then finally, there's the code for the init command, which is something the user would run in order to initialize a new disk. And that puts the structures on it that um, are required by CP68's file management system. And then it also puts the bootloader down there on track zero. And so those three routines, Roberto decided to go ahead and recreate the source files for those to make it easier for us to update them for the Southwest Technical Machine. The author actually provided sample code for each of these three files for a variety of different hardware configurations. One of those is our Southwest Technical 6800 computer configuration that we're running. And here you see the disk driver that he provided for this configuration. And this disk driver is usable basically exactly like it is. However, his boot routine and the init routine for the Southwest Technical Computer required that you change the standard configuration of the Southwest Computer. And neither Roberto or I really wanted to do that. We would prefer to write those routines so that the Southwest Technical could remain in its standard configuration because you might want to use it for other things than CP68. So in the end, we ended up changing both the boot routine and the init routine from what the author provided for those two. In addition to customizing these three files we've been talking about, there are going to be some other patches that have to be made in order to make this actually work. And I've decided to pull all those patches together and put them in the uh, disk driver code down at the end so that whenever we load our disk driver on top of CP68, these patches get applied as well. So for example, CP68 does all system calls by using the 6800's software interrupt instruction. So we have to point that vector to jump to the proper spot in CP68. And if you look at this code you hear on the screen, the cold entry point is what does that. So when CP68 starts, we patch it to jump to this cold routine which takes the vector that um, SWATBUG jumps through and puts in the address within CP68 to jump to. Uh, under the other patches, the console port address had to be updated to 8004, where it is in the uh, Southwest Technical Machine. The location of the number of sectors had to be patched in a couple of places as well. And then the location of the free list sector had to be patched in a few locations as well. So when we make this system, we'll load CP68's S record file, but then when we load our disk driver file subsequently, it will overwrite all those locations within CP68 with the patches you see here. So given all this background, let's now take a look at how I actually built a bootable CP68 disk. The console is going to be a terminal emulator so that I can send S record files and use the load command in SWATBUT. So here you see the very first command is an L and in my comments, I say I send the CP68 S record file. So now CP68 is in memory. The next thing I do is issue another load command in SWATBUT. And this time I send the disk driver file. Then at this point that overlays the disk driver that the author provided with our Southwest technical one and those patches I just got through showing you. At this point we can jump to the entry point of CP68 which is at 100 hex and we actually see um, CP68 come up and run. That's the Hemingway Associates that you see there. The dot prompt is the CP68 uh, command prompt. I type exit, we go back to swap bug. You can see the dollar sign there. Then I use the load command in swap bug again to load the init program that allows us to initialize a disk. Now boot is actually part of init. It gets written to the disk by init. So I have to load that into memory as well. And by modifying memory location 28, like you see here, I can force it to think it got a command parameter of drive zero. And then I jump to 2100 to actually execute init. And here we see the prompt from init just asking us to confirm we really want to initialize this disk. And at that point we hit Y and it goes off and it runs that process. And it takes quite a while to go through the entire disk. With the disk now initialized and ready to use, I jump back into the warm start entry point of CP68. I have my dot prompt and can now type some CP68 commands. I use the save command to write out what we currently have in memory. 
Now the save command is a memory resonant command, meaning it does not have to load it from disk, which is a good thing because I have nothing on disk at this point. So I can save the memory image of CP68, complete with our driver in it and all the patches. I can save the code that is the init command. I can save the code that is the boot command. And at that point, I have three files on my disk. And now I can go move on to the next step where I can actually make this disk bootable. So the very last statement you see here is I'm exiting back to swap bug to complete that step. To make a disk bootable, I have to tell the boot routine in track zero where to find the CP68 system file out on the disk. That program is called link. And so you see here that I'm using the swap bug command to load link into memory. And then I go back into CP68 and I save that out as a command on disk. Now I'm able to run it here at the dot prompt where you see where I type link. That's the link program running. It's asking for the system file name. I tell it what it is. That allows Link to know the track and sector where it's located, and it patches that into the boot sector uh, where the, our cold boot routine is, so it knows where to find cp68.sys. At that point, I can run the boot command, and you see I've typed dot boot. I mean, I've typed boot at the dot prompt, and cp68 comes up and runs. The next thing I did was do a hard reset on the computer and try the swat bug boot command. That's the D command and you can see that it also works and comes up into uh, CP68. So at that point I do an exit, go back to the monitor and start loading. For example, I've given two examples here, the other commands that form the core part of CP68. These are its transient commands and we'll go into what that means more later. Here you see I load the uh, S record file for the assign command, save that out to disk. Then I load the S record file for the delete command, save that out to disk. And then repeat that for all the other commands that are part of CP68's core functions and save those out to disk. And at this point, I have a complete disk with all of the transient commands that CP68 expects and it's bootable and we can now continue with the demonstration. So after lots of background material and lots of talking, I figured we should at least go ahead and boot the CP68 operating system on this computer. We'll just do a very brief introduction today, and then the next video will go into more detail about the commands and compare it to Flex and compare it to CPM. All right, so let me do a reset on the machine, and here we see the swap bug prompt that's coming from our monitor. Now, as we mentioned, we wrote the boot routine so that it was consistent with um, the standard configuration of the 6800 computer, and that includes swap bug as well, so that we did not have to change that. So I can actually boot. Um, CP68 with a disk boot command that's part of swap bug. That command goes out to track zero, loads the bootloader, the bootloader in turn goes out and loads CP68 into memory, and that's the cold boot banner from uh, CP68. The dot is the command prompt. One of the first things you probably want to do is a directory command that goes out and shows us what's on disk. And like CPM and like Flex, we have eight character file names, we have three character extensions. Um, CP68 has several built-in commands, memory resonant commands, kind of like uh, CPM does. The directory command is one of those. Uh, there's a command to load files into memory, save them. We saw er using that earlier. Exiting to the monitor is one of those. Renaming a file is one of those. Those are all built-in commands that are just run straight out of CP68's own memory. Then the rest of the commands come here from disk, like uh, they do with flex, .cmd files or like they do in CPM, any .com file. However, there is some differences compared to Flex the way these .cmd files are handled in uh, CP68. And we'll look at more of that in the, in the next video. All right, so that's gonna wrap up this one with just a brief introduction to how we got CP68 running on this computer. And then in the next video, we'll go ahead and use CP68 and see some of its pros and some of its cons and see how it compares to Flex.